Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we are here today uh, to roll out Ambassador Alberto Fernandez's new uh, paper for us on countering ISIS propaganda called Here to Stay and Growing, Combating ISIS Propaganda Networks. Uh, this is a paper that came out of our annual U.S. Islamic World Forum, uh, which was held in June this year in Doha. Um, and uh, one of the working groups was devoted to countering Islamic State propaganda. And Ambassador Fernandez was fresh off his stint at the State Department, uh, leading its efforts in countering ISIS propaganda. So he had a good inside view uh, into uh, how the sausage is made. So he, we thought he was the perfect guy to, to run this working group. So this paper uh, is an outgrowth of that working group. Um, Today's event, we'll be using the hashtag ISIS propaganda. Um, and it is my pleasure, my real pleasure, to welcome both Ambassador Fernandez and Ambassador Richard LeBaron. Uh, to my knowledge, this is the first time uh, that both men will have been on the stage together to discuss their experiences running U.S. counter propaganda against jihadist organizations. Ambassador LeBaron uh, was the first incumbent. Uh, of the position of uh, coordinator of the Center for Strategic Counterterrorism Communications. He's also a former uh, ambassador to Kuwait and is currently a non-resident fellow with the Atlantic Council. He was followed by Ambassador Alberto Fernandez, uh, the author of the paper, uh, who was there from 2012 to 2015. Ambassador Fernandez was, was uh, uh, the chief of mission to Sudan and to Equatorial Guinea, uh, and is currently a vice president at the Middle East Media Research Institute, uh, otherwise known as MEMRI. Uh, Ambassador Fernandez is going to come up and present uh, his major findings and policy recommendations in the paper, uh, and then uh, Ambassador LeBaron and I will join him on stage for a discussion of the paper, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Ambassador Fernandez? Uh, thank you, Will, and thank you to uh, Brookings, and especially to the uh, members of the uh, working group that we had on ISIS propaganda at uh, uh, the Brookings Doha conference this year. Uh, this paper is very enriched by the uh, the dialogue of a wide range of of scholars and experts and practitioners uh, that we had at that at that event. When when I wrote the paper, the best thing you do when you write papers is you write them for yourself. Um, and there were four questions that I asked myself that I wanted to at least try to answer or try to begin to answer. Number one. How did ISIS propaganda become what it became, what it is? The second one, something which a lot of people have written about is, what is the nature of its appeal? The third one is something near and dear to the hearts of those, especially who are now retired and can criticize people in the government. What is the state of play in anti-ISIS messaging efforts? There have been a variety of efforts from a variety of governments. And the fourth one, what are the steps that a stronger response or a better response would include? <clears throat> becoming, right? The first one, the uh, how did ISIS propaganda become what it is today? You know, the roots were always there. Abu Musab al-Zarqawi was a um, showman. Uh, you can call him many things, but he was a showman. Uh, of violence, of blood, of, uh, of, of language. Uh, so the roots were there. He spoke of Dabik. He spoke of ap apocalyptic themes. Uh, the, the Islamic State of Iraq was a proto-caliphate. It had all the hint, hint, nudge, nudge. We're going to declare a caliphate. Caliph is coming. All of that was there. But if you look at ISIS propaganda in 2011, 2012, it is different than what it is today. It is more inward-looking more amateurish, more domestic in 2011, moving into 2012, and it became, over time, more global, adventurous, and creative. You have only to look at, for example, Salil al-Sawadam, Clanging of the Swords Part 1, appearing in June 2012, 
and compare it to the infamous or famous Salil Sawadam number four in May of 2014 to see the graduation or the change. Salil Sawadam part one was good. It was not uh, that amateurish. Salil Sawadam number four was great. Now it was partially great because it was about real events. What I mean is real substantial historical events. Of course, the subject, one of the subjects of Salil Sawadam number four was the fall of Fallujah, uh, an event that occurred at the same time that President Obama called the um, ISIS a junior varsity team. What changed was Syria. That's my uh, contention. Syria, this first social media war, the war that attracted Western Muslims in an unprecedented number, the first tweeted war. ISIS also at the time tapped into a growing Salafi subculture in the West, which has kind of become an alternative to the traditional religious leadership. Um, this first tweeted war, it was about Syria, and it just happens that Syria is special. Uh, Syria and the apocalyptic worldview of, of of ISIS is extraordinarily important. It's extraordinarily consequential. We're not talking about Waziristan. We're not talking about Northern Mali. We're not talking about some ungoverned space in the middle of nowhere. We're talking about Bilad al-Sham, the special place, the extraordinary place. There's a reason why when the Nusra Front, which at the time, of course, had a connection with ISIS or became ISIS with the Islamic State of Iraq, right? In 2011, the Islamic State of Iraq sends people from Iraq to Syria to set up the Nusra Front. When the Nusra Front establishes its media outlet, it's, what is it called? It's called Al-Manar Al-Bayda, the White Minaret. What is the White Minaret? The White Minaret is the, ma, is the, is the minaret in Damascus where when Jesus returns in the second coming, that is where he appears. So Syria was special, and it's that encounter of the Islamic State of Iraq with events in Syria, with, with people in Syria, with the way that events are covered in Syria, which takes its media from good to great. I focus particularly on one of many products that they put out, this one called Nawafiz, al -Arda, uh, Nawafiz fil Ard al-Malahim, uh, Windows uh, in the Land of Epic Battles, which ran from 2013-14, because I wanted to look at events before everyone started talking about ISIS. You know, before June 2014, when Mosul fell, Caliphate was declared, and everyone was talking about that. So. So you see, basically, through uh, windows on the land of ep epic battles, you see this evolving. You see images from fighting in Iraq coupled with talk about Syria. And over time, it's more about Syria, and Iraq is still there. But at the beginning, it's basically showing people being killed in Iraq, the Islamic State p killing people in Iraq, and talking about Syria. It's kind of foreshadowing or foretelling a move towards Syria, a move towards that. So that's the becoming, that's how it became what it was. The encounter with Syria, the encounter with Twitter, which also happens in 2013, the encounter with English, which also happens in 2013, uh, you know, turbocharged ISIS propaganda. The second part is I talked about the appeal. What is the appeal of, of, uh, of what ISIS does? It is not necessarily about winning hearts and minds. There's some of that, but the idea that we're fighting a battle over hearts and minds with ISIS is not exactly true. What it seeks to present is a stark choice about the correct message. Of course, ISIS talks about al-manhaj, you know, the method of what it's doing. Highlighting certain things. Number one, an emergency is happening. The Muslims are being slaughtered. The Sunni Arab Muslims of Syria are being slaughtered, right? This, of course, has the advantage for the Islamic State of being something which is true, or at least somewhat true. Uh, the best propaganda is obviously always connected with the real world and with the truth. So this, this element of emergency is coupled with the question, the element of agency. Not only are the people of Sham, this beloved place, this important place being slaughtered, but you, John Q. Public, John Q. Muslim in Manchester or Paris or wherever, you have a role to play with this. You have a responsibility. As one of the videos says in May uh, 
2014, one of the English language videos, these are golden days and you don't want to be on the sidelines, do you? You want to be part of this. The third thing uh, which is there, of course, is the whole question of authenticity. This organization, this austere, grim, savage organization, all of these elements enhance its authenticity. The fact that it's violent, the fact that it's ruthless, the fact that it's zealous for the law, that it has this extreme focus on utopianism, on bringing about the fulfillment of prophecy, the fulfillment of the caliphate, all of these things accentuates its authenticity. The fact that these are men in black carrying a black flag uh, that looked that came out of a ninja movie or video game is part of its attraction. It is about religion, but it's about lots of other things as well. So you have emergency, you have agency, you have authenticity, and of course, you have victory. Baqiya wa tatamaddad, here to stay and expanding and growing. And of course, victory is proof of God's approval. So that is the themes. Those are kind of a quick summary of the themes of it. The state of play. Uh, in the paper, I talk about the many different approaches and many different agencies and entities that have tried, tried and largely failed, although that's with a caveat. Um, the United Kingdom, the United States, uh, European Union, Arab government. And of course, when we talk about failure, we should always talk about, I always think about this when the U.S. government talks about credible voices. There's no one more credible when it comes to jihad than Al-Qaeda. And of course, Al-Qaeda failed in its efforts to reign in uh, the Islamic State. It largely failed in its efforts to uh, stop it, to stop its growing. So governments and even terrorist groups have not been successful in quelling the, the, the advance of the Islamic State, but that doesn't mean that there aren't valuable elements in all these approaches. Generally, these approaches have been limited in scope. Many of them were, of course, created to fight Al-Qaeda, not to fight the Islamic State. Um, they were limited in, sco in scope. They were confused politically and underfunded. I say confused politically because, of course, there's both kind of the, the kind of bread and butter work of bureaucracy and governments and the kind of not that great way that governments work. That's part of the political part. But also, of course, what is the message that you're going to have about a utopian state and violence for the sake of God and the end of the world? So there's a question of kind of what is the response? What is the answer that you, that you, that you can come up with? It is difficult for risk-averse governments to match the Islamic State's advantages in, as Charlie Winter said in his uh, recent paper, volume and originality. Which brings me to the response. One of the problems we face is that governments often too, end, too often os oscillate between triumphalism and despair. We're winning the battle against the extremists. We've got them on the run. Or, oh my God, they're everywhere. They're coming out of the woodwork. Uh, they're under the bed. Um, the reality is that what we need is a constant effort, realizing that this is not an easy task. This is a difficult task. If it was easy, somebody would have done it long ago and it would have been a simple thing. One of the reasons CSCC was created was a realization that the, the war of counter-messaging, the war of propaganda against terrorist groups, against Al-Qaeda was not an easy one. So there's several recommendations that I make. I'll go through them quickly. Uh, number one, and this cannot be underemphasized because it's something that not at CSCC, but in government in general, I've encountered over and over, which is that the problem of the Islamic State is a political problem with a media dimension, not the other way around. All too often we think that these issues are issues of PR or propaganda or messaging. They're related to the real world. There's a real war in Syria and Iraq. There's real violence. There are real people being killed. Mosul did fall to the Islamic State. It was an imaginary. So we need to realize that when we talk about messaging, it is intrinsically linked to a political reality that you cannot divorce propaganda from the political reality on the ground. Number two, volume. It takes a network to fight a network. And still, 
despite some efforts, despite some baby steps in that direction, we still lack the volume necessary to at least be able to compete in this space. Uh, volume has value. And the Islamic State, either itself or with its, its networks of, uh, of uh, Fursan al-Tahmil, the fanboys, the knights of the uploading, still has the advantage in numbers. And there is, there is value in an echo chamber. We all know it in our lives. We see it every day. Sometimes you see somebody, a politician or whoever, somebody say something really stupid. But if a lot of people <laughs> applaud and cheer it on, it takes a life of its own. It adds oomph to it. So the echo chamber effect is important. One thing that I've always wondered that government hasn't done yet, and maybe the US government or other governments are working on it, there is a wealth of credible voices of people who have firsthand knowledge of ISIS violence that have not been fully tapped. The Islamic State in April and in August of 2014 killed almost 1,000 male members of the Shaitat tribe, uh, a Sunni Arab Muslim tribe in Syria. These are Syrian Arab Muslims being killed, Sunni Muslims being killed. We know that there are Shaitats, uh, Shaitat tribesmen as refugees and refugee camps. They're in places like al Hasaki and stuff like that. So there are people who have their own stories to tell their own first-hand stories to tell. And that's true whether you talk about Iraqi tribes from Anbar province, uh, you know, Syrian IDPs and others. I would think that a good investment for a Western government or a Middle Eastern government would be to hire, I don't know, 500 Syrian refugees or 500 Syrian IDPs and teach them how to tweet. They probably know how to tweet, probably better than a lot of people. Uh, and empower them to go on and challenge extremists in social media. That's actually an easy fix. It's, it's also one that's not very expensive. The third point, of course, is content. There is all too much emphasis on the search for the magic bullet. If we did only this thing, if we only had this video, um, whereas what you need is you need multifaceted content similar to the multifaceted content that the Islamic State produces. Islamic State does not produce one type of thing. It produces many things. So you need to have every approach. You need to have different types of stuff, whether it be sarcasm, whether it be uh, a, a fact-based approach, whether it be an ideological approach, something that perhaps is not best done by governments or especially by the US government. There is an ideological struggle. There is an ideological dimension to the ISIS battle. And that is something that someone needs to address in some way. Um, so those are kind of the, the, the outlines of at least some common sense steps that I think could not solve the problem, because I say this is essentially a political problem with deep roots in the region, but at the very least seek to challenge the extremists, challenge uh, ISIS and its colleagues in the space that they're, at, that they're at. Even if ISIS is destroyed, it has energized extremist discourse in a way that we haven't seen before. Not just on the caliphate, but on questions of prophecy, on different views of Salafism, on concepts like al-wala' wal-bara, what does it mean to be loyal, who are you loyal to, uh, and, and things like slavery, like jizya and these other things. The fourth point is something which is really important, I think, and people are beginning to look at, is the question, how are people radicalized? People are not radicalized in one way, and people are not radicalized only by social media. There is a personal dimension that often occurs in radicalization. Yes, I'm consuming stuff. I'm getting angry about the war in Syria, but then somebody, my cousin, my brother, my neighbor, my imam, the guy I play soccer with. There is an individual, personalized, tailored dimension that also can happen indirectly through social media, through Skype or through instant messaging. So this one-to-one -one dimension, that radicaliz the understanding that radicalization is not only digital needs to be addressed. There are people already doing this as individuals. I often talk about Mubin Sheikh, who's this Canadian uh, 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 colleague who works in this field, who has this kind of little sub way of doing it, which is effective for certain audiences. Uh, 
you don't need a thousand Mubin Sheikhs. You need people like him and people who are different from him and who have different approaches or similar approaches. So you need to somehow find that individualized connection, whether it be social workers or, or trusted tweeters from communities that, are, that, that work with government, but you need to find a way to mimic or replicate the personal dimension what Heghammer calls the cultural emotional dimension of radicalization. It says it's about feelings as well as other things. Finally, greater policing of, of space. I strongly agree with J.M. Berger and Jessica Stern in their book uh, on, on ISIS that there is value in taking their stuff down. There is value in making things more difficult for them. You're never gonna get everything, and I'm certainly not uh, in favor of curbing free speech, but there's value in making things more difficult for them in this ungoverned space with this social media. So there are no magic bullets. There's no golden fleece or holy grail in doing this, but there are practical steps that we, can, at the very least, can begin to address this challenge that we face. Thank you very much. I can project. Oh, there yeah. it is. Yeah. I told you I could project. Um, Ambassador Barron, I want to turn first to you for comment. Uh, Ambassador Fernandez has painted a pretty sweeping picture of the development of ISIS propaganda and U.S. government efforts to uh, deal with it. You were the first incumbent of the position of coordinator uh, for this new institution that the State Department set up in 2011. Uh, to combat uh, jihadist propaganda. Um, you were intimately involved with the creation of the organization's strategy and, and staffing it. Having done that and then having been able to uh, step outside of it for, for, for a few years, what do you make of uh, the policy recommendations that Ambassador Fernandez has put forward? The only thing I really learned and relearned was to surround yourself with smart people, as I've done today. When I took on the job from uh, or the first to be the first coordinator, it was because nobody knew what to do, and nobody really wanted to do it. It wasn't because I had any skill in social media or communications. I was a classic foreign policy generalist who accepted the job. There were nobody. There was nobody else who wanted it. <laughs> um, so it wasn't the rigorous selection process to find the best guy. It was me uh, or nobody else. And uh, I was at the end of my career. I had planned to retire, and the recession hit. And I figured, well, I need another two years on my pension. So I was highly motivated. <laughs> But I did surround myself with very smart people. Will McKentz was one of them, who was an early advisor, very sharply critical of my early efforts, which I resented intensely <laughs> until I figured out that he was indeed right. And uh, we moved on from there. But uh, I can't emphasize enough how you really need people like Alberto and the team that we both assembled with imagination, creativity, the ability, and the space to take some risk. Uh, and that space is very small in our government, uh, but you need that space. I want to make five general comments about Alberto's excellent paper. 
First, the paper, as you heard, provides an excellent understanding of the practices of the ISIL information cadres. And this history of the history and evolution is a valuable, invaluable in understanding just what this phenomenon is. Uh, particularly important in this regard, I would note his repeated statements about how the facts on the ground support the message. Um, it's not the other way around. This has very broad implications. But one of the narrower ones is that propaganda alone does not produce results, either for terrorists or for those who work against them. And as Syria was a fortuitous event for the terrorists, I can relate a fortuitous event while I was in charge of CSCC. Along came the Arab Spring. Nobody wanted to see any Al Qaeda people on Jazeera after that. They were uninteresting. These little speeches by Zarqawi and others, they were boring compared what was, to what was going on on the streets of Cairo and so forth. Now, it's just, you know, they, they weren't newsworthy. As Alberto said as well, there need to be a whole bunch of other factors that influence both individual and organizational decisions. And this goes to the debate about whether the internet and social media are independent radicalizers. So many people, so much of the conventional wisdom thinks that they are, that all you have to do if you're smart in ISIL is get on Twitter and radicalize some guy in Wales. Uh, it doesn't happen that way, as Alberto said. It also has very important implications for the notion of counter-messaging. The message needs to be compelling. It has to somehow get beyond the policy difficulties that Alberto identified. If we, have a, if we have a lousy message on Syria in general, we're going to have a lousy message on Twitter, and nobody's going to be too interested in that lousy message. So it, the fact that it doesn't work shouldn't be a surprise. Second set of observations. Alberto's identification of urgency, agency, authenticity, and victory, extremely important, the way he framed that. The urge to do something, another way of saying agency, in the face of perceived injustice is strong. And counter-propaganda has not really addressed this issue of doing something. Um, ISIL says, here's what you can do. We say, here's what you can't do. But we don't really come up with anything to do. And some teenager, either in Jordan or Tunisia or Belgium, wants to know what he or she can do, not what he can't do. Any of you are, who are parents know that telling people what not to do often produces the exact opposite result. I agree with Alberto that ISIS has managed to make some very effective propaganda. Where I might stray from his further analysis is in gaining an understanding of how effective it is. I agree that the message contains the key, key, key elements he, he, he identified. But for all the panicked headlines about the flow of fighters to Syria, I think the ISIS brand is a failure in many ways. I was in Belgium and the UK last week talking to authorities about recruits and returnees. Many of the people attracted and many who go and come back are seriously incapable people, either emotionally disturbed or just not very able. So we need to first differentiate who's who in this target audience of people we want to influence. A former major in the Iraqi army has a whole different set of motivations and capabilities than does a young socially isolated kid in Antwerp. And we really need to differentiate between and among these people in the way that we not only message to them, but that we treat them in, in a variety of ways. And we need to ask ourselves, if this media campaign by ISIL is so effective, why aren't there a whole lot of more Muslim adherents? According to Pew Research, there are at least 800 million Muslims under 24. Why isn't there a huge swelling of support in the Islamic world? Why does such a tiny percentage of Muslim youth, even among those who absorb the propaganda, actually act on it? And you can be absolutely sure that the ISIL communicators are sitting around in little forums like this saying, what are we doing wrong? We've got agency, we've got urgency, we've got emergency, we've got Syria. Where are these people? 
Why aren't they joining up in by the thousands and thousands every day? Why aren't there planes flying in every minute loaded with young Muslims from Malaysia and India and Pakistan and wherever they are? So I think, you know, let's not overestimate the effectiveness of these crazies. Third point. I think it's also helpful that Alberto noted the use of Islamic clerics. He noted in his paper to rebut, rebut ISIS and AQ is nothing new. And he was right to point out this doesn't always work with clerics themselves sometimes providing very mixed messages and very sectarian messages that certainly the US government doesn't want to be associated with. It also goes to the ongoing debate about who is a credible voice. Most outside experts sagely opine that the US government cannot be a credible voice. We don't know how to talk to these people. We don't speak the same language, blah, 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 blah. And they act as if people like Alberto and myself are so naive and stupid that we don't realize this, that we don't realize how incredible we are. Of course we do. Of course we do. And that's why we try to get as close to the target as we possibly can, understand what motivates them, understand when it would be more useful to have a counterpart tweet, to work through an NGO, a Somali NGO or a Pakistani NGO, both of which we did during our tenure, but only the tweets and the videos get the, get the publicity. But of course we know that you've got to get right up there close, either with your social media and your, your uh, message, or with other means, family, peers, imams, etc. You've got to get close because these people are first extremely difficult to identify because there are so few of them. And second, they have all kinds of different motivations that are not simply going to be addressed by political messages. Related to this is Alberto's conclusion that current efforts have not been successful. And I think he made a good point that current efforts you know, have been pitifully small, pitifully small. I mean, I ran a little craft shop when I was there, and his wasn't much bigger by the time he left. You know, what did we have, 30, 40 people maybe at the most? Um, so we're not, you know, we really haven't tested the proposition of volume, as he said. And, I, and it's important to realize that efforts directly focused on CVE issues are part of a big stream of information that has nothing to do with CVE. It, the news about Syria is enough for a lot of people. They don't need a special messaging. They can read the New York Times, or they can read Al-Haram. Al 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 so it doesn't, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a small element in a big flow of information. Just a few brief comments on Alberto's suggestions. I really agree with uh, most of everything he said. The idea of support for online teams of Syrians, I think it's a great, great idea. Um, you, that said, you're not going to control the message. I mean, these guys are all going to have a different angle. And so if you think the U.S. government can hire them and say, you're going to say this, that would be probably the most ineffectual thing we could, we could do. So I, we're, we're going to have to find somebody else to, to take on the supervision. Uh, also, his observation that the, you need to emulate the close personal relationship that ISIS builds when it actually radicalizes people, that's just fundamental. It's just fundamental, and it's something we haven't really internalized. We keep thinking that there's the magic tweet, there's the magic message. It's right up close and personal is where you have to be, and the social media is just going to be one part of that. I agree with him on better policing of social media. I think it's, you know, there are things we can do now that don't have anything to do with freedom of speech. Um, that are easily done and just take just about that much courage. Uh, finally, about my own general biases on this. We talk about counter-narratives. And for me, the counter-narrative is us. You know, the counter-narrative is us. It's us as a country. It's the West. What we do, how we behave, what we do in the Middle East, what, we, what our policies are. And... You know, what it disappoints me is that we think we can take a little thing like CVE and that can substitute for what we really need, which is a broad, multifaceted, sustained engagement with the Muslim world. 
We talk about long-term change. We talk about we've got to be prepared for the long term. Do we have any strategy for the long term? For engaging the Muslim world? Does anybody know about one? Because I'd like to sign on. I'd like to participate in that strategy. You know, we have instruments. We have exchange programs. We have fabulous ways of bringing people here. We have, you know, we have high school students from the Muslim world who study here for a year every year. We have a 100,000 Saudis who most people don't even know about studying in this country, who we don't even talk to, who ghettoize themselves in universities around this country. And, you know, this is an opportunity lost. So we need an information and an outreach and an engagement strategy that includes countering violent extremism, but is not driven by it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so to begin with, I just want to ask you both a very basic question. Um, and it has to do with the reason why the US government does this kind of activity to begin with. I remember um, when I started at State Department in 2009, the general thinking was uh, that the US government should really not dignify terrorist propaganda with the response. Um, and that made sense on a certain level if you're talking about uh, someone like the president or the secretary of state. Of course, you would not want them elevating the propaganda. But it seemed to be a missed opportunity when it came to more day-to-day -day tactical exchanges. And this is why one reason uh, why the CSCC was created was to do this kind of uh, routine response and correcting uh, of, the, of the lies that were being put out by U.S. enemies, particularly those like Al-Qaeda and later the Islamic State. But I wanted to ask the basic question, why does the U.S. government do this kind of thing? And wouldn't it be better if the U.S., given all of the problems that you've outlined, wouldn't it be better if it just didn't do it after all? Well, I mean, uh, I think, first of all, you have to put the... You're talking about CSCC or, or counterterrorism communications, you have to put it within the context of what the U.S. government tried to do in terms of communications after 9-11. There's the sense, which I think is a, you know, there's some accurate, uh, there's some truth to it, that there was a, a failure to communicate, that things were not being communicated as well as they could have. And so there were a variety of efforts after 9-11 by uh, the Bush administration, um, and then it went over into, into the Obama administration to come up with some kind of team. As you know, parts of actually what CSCC had date back from that period. So there, there, there was an effort, and I think it's a laudable one, to say somebody needs to be out there correcting the record. Hey, I was on Al Jazeera last week, and I was on with a guy that said, Assad is an American dog, a Zionist, and a Mason. <laughs> and I was on telling the public in Al Jazeera that this guy was a lunatic. So there is value in, 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 you know, in calling BS on your adversary. There is value in engaging. There is value in, in arguing. The problem is, I think uh, Richard is absolutely right, is that you know, counter-messaging or responding to your opponent or, or getting in their face is not some kind of panacea. It's not some kind of magic bullet. Yes, you need to mix it up. Yes, you need to fight the good fight and correct the record. But it's also not uh, some kind of magic pixie dust, as I called it in one uh, interview. So. Right, Richard? Secretary Clinton was very interested in this project, and it wouldn't have happened, frankly, if she hadn't gotten behind it in a serious way. Yeah. Because there was a tremendous amount of skepticism in the bureaucracy about even doing it. And there was a tremendous amount of skepticism about the State Department's ability to coordinate an interagency effort like this. But I betrayed Secretary Clinton because what she thought we were going to do was set up some sort of a 24-hour control room, which would have all our operators there at their screens, and a message would come in from Al-Qaeda, and boom, we would shoot back at Al-Qaeda. This was her vision. Now, that's a sensible vision. That's what you want to do. That's how you, if you're, especially if you're a politician and you've run one of these response teams that they've run for the last 20 years, uh, you do that sort of work. What we found is basically logistically it wouldn't work. 
And frankly, you know, we would be setting ourselves up as an equal of Al Qaeda. I mean, Al Qaeda is a terrorist group. You know, we're a superpower. Give me a break. You know, we're not going to have a ping pong game with these guys every day. We need to deal, deal with them in a strategic way. We need to figure out who's listening to them, talk to those people, understand the target, and go after those few people who are actually influenced by them. It was not for me ever a war of ideas. In previous administrations, it was only a war of ideas. As if, as if Al Qaeda had an idea that would compete with Western liberal capitalism in any effective way. I mean, what were we thinking? <laughs> it was ridiculous. And so I, we, my effort was narrow, narrow, narrow to where the real problem is. I'm not saying we got there necessarily, but that was the effort. I got the feeling sometimes at State and after I left that messaging, talking about messaging, particularly at the higher levels of government, almost became um, a way to avoid talking about the hard policy choices that had to be made. If, 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 if a message wasn't being well received, well then the fix was to make a better message. But rarely did you hear discussion of the actual policy behind the messaging. And I think both of you hinted at that in your remarks, and I, I, I wanted to know, um, I wanted to get a sense, and I wonder if you could give the audience a sense of the political constraints that an organization like the CSCC uh, labors under. I mean, it's, it's not an independent NGO. It is a servant of the American people first, but also their elected representatives. Um, and those folks are making decisions that don't always message very well. What, what kind of political constraints were there during your tenures? How long is this program? <laughs> uh, this is a huge problem. Uh, I remember when we began messaging on Syria in a serious way in summer of 2012, and I actually went to NEA and explained to them that we were going to do this, and you know, Syria was the issue in the Arab world. Uh, in 2012, maybe even, it still is, but maybe even more so in 2012, 2013. Um, and I told them right off, I said, you know that we're actually, we're going to be messaging on an issue where we're losing. Uh, you know, you want us to basically tell people don't become terrorists, don't join, jo don't join Al Qaeda in, 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 uh, in Syria. And what the people we're interacting with want to know is, are you going to do anything about Assad? Are you going to do anything to stop the carnage? What's the U.S. position on this? So we're basically telling people, we're not going to talk to you about what you want to talk about. Let's talk about what we want to talk about over here. So we knew going in that we basically had a losing hand uh, on Syria. There was absolutely no doubt in any of our minds uh, that, that we are basically messaging in a thing where we had not one hand, but both hands tied behind our back. Uh, this always continued to be the case. I think there's this emphasis, you know, Edward R. Murrow, of course, always had this line about, you know, if you want me to be in on the crash landings, I better be in on the takeoffs. There is all too often in government the idea that public diplomacy or public affairs is some kind of Mr. Fix-It that can kind of cover up for policy mistakes for policy de decisions, that the policy decisions have no cost. So I, I often felt that we were held to a kind of unfair standard, you know? Uh, you know, w as, as I remember telling a colleague or a colleague told me, I forget which, uh, we, we joked uh, after we produced a video in June of, one video that we did in June of 2014, we said, the Islamic State just took a city of two million people and we're countering them with a video. Uh, you know, uh, propaganda is part of the real world. Yeah, Richard, you mentioned that you were at the helm during the halcyon days of the early Arab Spring. So one could imagine that the political constraints may have been less or may have been different. Let me come at it from a little different approach, a more bureaucratic one. Um, to put together 
an interagency group that does something a little bit edgy, a little bit different in the U.S. government requires the president and cabinet members to actually be involved to get it done. As pitiful as that sounds, that's what it requires. I had that after a year on the job, got that, and I got, with that, I got another year to do what I wanted because they were tired of focusing on it at that point. And I, we did something else that Alberto didn't have the luxury to do. We only operated in Arabic and Urdu. Once CSCC started operating in English, all the nitwits came out of the closet. <laughs> nitwits are known as uh, terrorism experts in my vocabulary. <laughs> um, and present company excluded. <laughs> but everybody knows how to do this. Everybody's an expert on how you counter terrorism. You know, you can see them on CNN. You can see them on Fox. There are a dime a dozen. Some of them have shaky CIA background. <laughs> <laughs> some of them don't. You know, some of them are just making a buck. But once you started doing this in English, then people could nickel and dime you to death. If they didn't know what you could, we were doing, and you had a little space to experiment, you could actually experiment. You could develop the tool. And the value of having these kinds of organizations is in the development of the instruments so that you figure out what the hell you're doing. You know, this is not simple, as, as Alberto said. So you need some space and you need some leadership in the government to give you that political space. But isn't it sad to think that to, to effectively accomplish something in government, you have to basically deceive people that is actually not actually taking place? <laughs> <laughs> I want to, Rich, I want to pick up on something you said and, and ask you, Alberto. Um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how the U.S. government measures the success of these efforts versus how the media measures the success of these efforts. Because I, I, I know um, that the media take on products uh, that the CSCC produces or the United States produces can have a big impact on how Congress views it, on how the NSC views it, which then can have a major impact on how the CSCC views it. That one's for you, Alberto. That's for uh, you. Well, yeah, um, you know, the, uh, this is, I think, not unique to this administration, but maybe it's particularly um, pertinent in this area that we're talking about. You know, the, the language and the tribe that this administration cares about most in this space is not in Anbar province, but is the tribe that lives between Northern Virginia and the island of Manhattan, right? <laughs> So, you know, John Oliver's opinion is more important than that of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's when it comes to this space. This is a political reality. Uh, so you're always going to face that challenge and that the way that, you know, uh, we had one, one reporter who wrote that uh, CSEC's budget was $1.3 billion. He basically took everything the U.S. government spends on public diplomacy and broadcasting and attribute it to our office of $5 million a year. So there's, a, you know, there's always going to be this kind of um, challenge that you're going to face. People's, you, you know, when you talk about metrics, there's the, the metric in your target audience that you try and use your international foreign target audience. But then there's the other target audience, which is the bureaucracy, the Western media, the the pundits, real or imagined. That's just the way the world is. So it's always a challenge. Ambassador LeBaron, I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about the bureaucracy. I, I think for people that haven't worked in the US government, particularly in this space around messaging, um, you might assume that it's, it, the messaging is, is very tight, it's very controlled, you know who all the players are. You start getting involved and you realize the messaging bureaucracy is gigantic because the U.S. government is gigantic. Uh, the CSCC notionally was in charge of coordinating messaging throughout the government. How did that work in practice? Pretty well. Uh, not that we coordinated all messaging, but that we learned you know, who was doing what, pretty much, and we were able to de-conflict that. 
and we didn't obsess over it. Um, and we had pretty good interagency cooperation. I think the people who were the most suspicious of us were the traditional public affairs people in the State Department who are driven by the press response. And that's a very controlled process within the State Department, which consumes literally half the day on the sixth and seventh floors of the State Department, just doing the press guidance. You'd think they'd have other things to do, but press guidance is policy. And that's the optic through which they saw some of this stuff. And basically, when, when members of my staff came up to me and said, you know, we've got this thing we want to say or this thing we're, video we're going to put out, should we clear it? Should we clear it with other offices in the State Department? And I said to them, why would we do that? Why would we do that? You know, and that was because of that system was so, it isn't called a fudge factory for nothing. You know, it is. And we would have never experimented. We've never got the organization off the ground had we not had the space, the bureaucratic and political space, to operate very independently. Thank you. I want to turn to uh, ISIS propaganda itself before I open it up for, for questions. Um, Alberto, the one shade of difference between you and, and Richard seems to be on the question of, of how effective Islamic State propaganda is. And this is, this is always a very difficult question to answer, uh, too. Um, but can you make the case uh, that they have uh, been more successful than, say, their predecessor, Al-Qaeda? Um, or is it that the bottom has just fallen out of the Middle East and now, you know, there are many more opportunities to go and join groups, whereas there weren't in the past. Yeah, it, I, I agree with that. It's both, right? It's, if, you look at the, if you look at the ISIS crime as, I'm not a crime novelist, but I like to read crime novels. If you think of uh, ISIS reality as a crime, right? You have uh, motive and opportunity. The motive is the worldview, is the ideology, it's the way that they see things. The opportunity is, of course, what developed, right? The implosion of, of regimes in the region, the loss of Hebat al-Dawla, the prestige and awe of the state, these states and state systems and state speakers, and you know, basically all authority in the, in, the, in the Middle East has been shaken by the Arab Spring and all these things. So there is a tremendous opportunity that was created. But, I mean, I would push back a little bit. I agree with Richard completely, is that if you're talking about 1.4 billion Muslims in the world, the fact that 30,000, 40,000, 50,000, whatever it is, the number keeps going up, a uh, number of people went and left their homes to join the Islamic State, it's not that big of a number. Um, on the other hand, compared to what other groups have done, it's impressive. Um, and you're talking about an organization that sees itself very much as a revolutionary vanguard. You know, it's not about the masses. It's about the masses maybe at some point in the future, but it's about a committed minority which has a clear view of what it wants and is going to be ruthless about implementing it. So, yeah, I agree. I think you have to be really careful about, you know, making them 10 feet tall. One of the best examples that we saw is ISIS did just, what, last month, a whole range of pretty well done videos about what? About don't go to Europe to be a refugee because that's bad, that's un-Islamic, they're going to convert you to Christianity, they're going to humiliate you, it's awful, blah, 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 blah. You look at it objectively, those videos had absolutely no effect whatsoever, as far as we can tell. So, so yeah, I mean, I think you're right. You, you need to te treat them seriously need to treat the effectiveness of their, of their outreach seriously without exaggerating it. Like I said, it's neither, neither despair nor triumphalism, and sometimes we go, we seem, seem to like those extremes. Ambassador LeBaron, a lot of jihadist messaging is religious, um, which can pose problems for the U.S. government uh, in formulating a response. One, because of our own tradition of secularism and strictly separating church and state, uh, but also uh, that 
we have been painted as a Christian crusader nation that is meddling in the affairs of, of Muslims. Can you talk about some of the problems posed by the religious nature of, say, ISIS's messaging and, and how the U.S. has to respond to it? Well, I think you could view this as a big problem or a little problem. I view it as a little problem. I think the U.S. government itself is not the right communicator on religion. The U.S. government, however, should talk about religion, you know, with people who know about it, people who should communicate it about it, people who do communicate about it. We have office of religion, an Office of Religious Freedom in the State Department. We care about that. So it's not that we you know, don't care about religious issues or don't need to understand them. I just think we have to find other ways of, of involving or not involving ourselves in the religious ferment in the Islamic world. And that's an example of a long-term issue that's going to play out in that world. And we have an obligation, in my sense, to engage on the full range of issues, religious being one, political another, violent extremism another, economics another, human rights another, the whole range of those issues. So it's, it's part of a package. Ambassador Fernandez, last question for you, and then I'll open it up to the audience. Um, you, in your paper, talk about the trajectory of Islamic State propaganda and how it has changed and and how those changes, if you're paying attention, can be meaningful and give you hints of where things are headed. I, I wonder if you had any thoughts based on recent Islamic State propaganda about where you think they might be headed as an organization. Well, that's a really good question. Uh, I wonder, I mean, I, I've talked several times, I talked here and I talked to, in the remarks on the podium about the connection between the real world and, and, um, and, and propaganda. And, and I think that actually... Uh, I, I don't think the Islamic State is going away that quickly soon. I think it's a, quite a challenge. But it is facing a situation where the, there is the possibility of a greater disconnect between the propaganda and the reality on the ground. There's a possibility of it. In the sense that so much of what they've put out is predicated on the concept of victory, of expansion, of growth of state building, uh, it's not easy, but it should not be impossible to kind of, you know, curb their, curb their enthusiasm, you know, clip their wings in, in that sense and create space, you know, <clears throat> where, there's a, where there's a space between, a big space between reality and the propaganda. I mean, right now you could say there's a space, but the bigger the space gets, you know, the more ridiculous, the less credible your propaganda is. You think about, you know, any dictatorship, what's, that, what's his name, Baghdad Bob, right? Baghdad Bob saying, oh, the Americans, and then there's a tank, American tank driving by, you know, as he's, as he's saying, the Americans are being defeated and stuff like that. So you want to kind of create the space. So I think we're at a point where they can be unmasked. What happens with this triumphalist propaganda, for example, if Raqqa is taken in the next few months from them. This is a challenge for them. Um, as we discussed last night, I mean, I think there's a, there's a weakness in the state. If you kill the leader, you kill the leader, okay, there'll be another leader, right? There'll be another caliph, there'll be another representative. Uh, but if the state project itself is seen as failing, th that does weaken the propaganda. Thank you. Okay, let's open it up to the audience. Dana. Thanks very much. Fascinating discussion. Um, I'm Garrett Mitchell, and I write the Mitchell Report. And um, I want to come back to the first question, I think, that, that Will posed, which has to do with whether or not <clears throat> the U.S. government ought to be in this business in the first place, and, and, and put a slightly different perspective on the question this way. Um, I spent um, a considerable chunk of time working for two of the large global advertising agencies on two of their largest brands, consumer product brands. 
And among the things that I became uh, fully aware of during that time was that, that the power of advertising and public relations and merchandising is really uh, operative at the margins. It does not make people uh, use mouthwash, have condensed soup, uh, and other uh, product is. It's when they are ready for the purchase, this aims them at a particular brand for a particular set of reasons that market research has been able to ferret out. It seems to me that the United States government uh, lacks both the, any government, lacks both the competency chops and the cultural chops to be in the business of messaging when I think I've heard f from this group, and I think w we would agree, that no amount, uh, no volume of, uh, of activity can counteract uh, a, a drone strike, uh, a hospital uh, that's blown up, and uh, so, as a consequence, I, I really, I, I would love to, I'd love to have you just say a little bit more about why you think, as I gather you do, there really is a role for uh, government in this space. And thanks, Richard. You want to take a shot first? Yeah, I think there is a role for government. I think it's a small role. I think it's a role in partnership with a lot of other efforts. But let me give you an example. I think. In that advertising, there's a parallel in, in, your, in your description of the effect on advertising that we pursued vigorously. We said to ourselves, where we want to get with our communications is into the head of the people who are thinking about not just extreme ideas, but about acting on it. We want to get to those people, the consumer who's about to make a decision, and we want to just nudge that decision. We just want to push it a little bit. Now, the question is, did we do that? Can we do that? Are we able to do that? In my view, it's worth trying to find out. I mean, either we're in a war with these terrorists or we're not. Either this is serious or it's not. And if we don't use all the tools, in addition to drone strikes and special ops, we will only securitize this issue. We will only think that the only way we can stop these people is killing them. And so why would we not spend a modest amount of money experimenting and to see if we could get to the source of the terror before those individuals join it? So that's my justification. It's money well spent if it's spent with an intelligent plan that is cognizant of the difficulties, has no illusions about how easy it is to get to that consumer or to change that consumer's mind, but tries to get closer and closer. And it's not just with advertising, it's through his peers, her mother, her associates. You know, it's not, it's a lot of different methods and it's not all about just a, a message in a, in a, in a video. Alberto, you want to weigh in on that? Uh, you know, uh, uh, I was a public diplomacy officer for 32 years, so I believe strongly in, 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 the, in the job of, of reaching out and, and, and engaging people and, and, and trying to convince them and trying to, to, to talk to them. So, so yeah, I think there's a value to it. You know, three years of CSEC's budget equals the cost of one drone, by the way. Uh, so, you know, I don't think, uh, you know, there are rounding errors in the U.S. government that are uh, greater than the money that was spent on this. So uh, I, I, I don't think it's, I think it's money that was well spent. Let me take a few questions now here, please, in the white here. Thank you. Hey, my name is Alev Akbulut, and I'm a German-American Turkish columnist. Um, I come from the diversity and inclusion um, perspective towards national security. So my question is, talking about ISIS without taking responsibility of how we, with our policies over decades and decades and decades, contributed to this phenomenon, or let me call it symptom, um, is um, a little insensitive, in my opinion. So I think we have to be really aware of that. So I'm wondering if you can comment on that, whether we have any um, anything to do with the fact that ISIS was, um, came up in the first place. And also, um, um, ISIS is, uh, so I think, 
Um, yeah, I think that's it. Okay. All right, let me take two more, please. There in the back. Yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It's coming. Hi. So I'm just curious. Um, you know, the State Department put out the anti-propaganda messages um, highlighting the barbary of ISIS. Um, I'm curious what your feeling is that this was aimed at a population that thrives on barbary, and um, what what you think the reasoning was behind that? Because it seems like it was a big mess. It's going to be for you, Alberto. All right, one more over here. Yeah, gentleman in the light blue tie right there. Thank you. Uh, Rabin Pasha, I'm former USG as well. I was a USAID uh, Middle East Bureau, and now I'm founder of Rebuild Kurdistan, which works with uh, youth engagement and employment as a way to uh, bring stability to the region. So I just got back from our bill, and I know, ambassadors, you're both familiar with, with that region. And one thing that I would love to hear from you about is the how we can leverage some of the resources and stakeholders and allies of the region and that local story, and one of the cases being the Iraqi Kurdistan region, which stands up against ISIS effectively, but is also under threat because of the um, refugee uh, populations that are uh, fledging to the area and is becoming economically and politically vulnerable. But another thing that I'd love to hear from you about is, and echoing what you said about how uh, the propaganda itself is also building on things that ISIS is offering to the people and how we're sort of lacking that counter-narrative locally. What about the younger generation? And what could be done in terms of engaging and providing the services and employment opportunities that would prevent them from going to that place, that threshold, in which they could turn one way or another uh, towards extremism? What, what can we be doing about that more? Uh, both civil society and USG. Thank you, um, Ambassador LeBaron. Uh, the, the contention that the U.S. Uh, has had a major role in creating a lot of the radicalism that we're seeing today, um, I imagine you would agree with a small part of that. But also, I'd like to hear your thoughts on how the United States can engage the younger generation, because following your work, at the Atlantic Council, I know it's a theme you talk about a lot, how the role of US public diplomacy in reaching out to the next generation of Muslim youth. I think it's no, you know, no secret that the adventure in Iraq had some unintended consequences and set back the image of the United States for decades. This is verges on the obvious. Um, so what do you do with that? Um, if you're a professional diplomat, you work with it, and you find out how you can work around it and work through it. You also have a set of conspiracy theories in the Middle East. Everywhere in the Middle East, everybody in the Middle East, from the most senior professionals and academics and leaders to the most junior clerks in the post office, who may believe that we are engaging with Iran so that we can limit the power of Sunni Muslims around the world, who may believe that we installed, uh, that we are supporting Assad uh, actively. Um, so you have to work through a lot of filters to get to the audience that you're dealing with in the Middle East and in the Islamic world, partly because of biases about US behavior, partly because of a, a, a brand of conspiracy theory that is very difficult to, to deal with. So you just have to work with it. It's not, it's, it's part of public diplomacy. I, my point on dealing with, with Muslim youth is a fairly simple one. Now, if we think we've got a long-term problem in the Muslim world, then we better deal with it as a long-term issue. And if we think it's a big problem, we better deal with it in a big way. You know, and a big way is engaging and trying to help people who are trying to create their own change, which everybody in the Middle East is trying to do. They're trying to change the place. There are very few people who are not interested in changing the place uh, because they're not happy. It's not a happy place for the most part. And so we need to be supportive. We need to be engaging. We need to be non-prescriptive. 
We don't need to sell the way we do things. We need to sell the idea that we are behind people who are trying to improve their own societies. And if we do that through scholarship programs, if we do that through exchange visitor programs, through engaging more fully in our Fulbright program, sending more Fulbright scholars to the region, bringing more here, we have all these instruments. And we use them in such a small measure. That's what distresses me. We have instruments that we know that work, that change people's lives, that help them change their society. And that's exactly what we need to do in the Middle East, but we don't have any strategy to do it. Thank you. Ambassador Fernandez, you were at the CSCC at a really interesting time because when you came in, it was still early days of the Arab Spring, and, and the organization's mandate was still really to message against al-Qaeda writ large. And al-Qaeda was... Um, a different creature than the Islamic State, at least its leadership, and, the, and its goals that it set for itself, particularly in its own messaging, were in some ways different. As you said in your remarks, Al-Qaeda Central really focused on winning over a broad segment of the Muslim population. And the Islamic State, um, in contrast, focuses on winning over a very narrow segment of the Muslim population. You don't light a fellow Sunni Muslim on fire and hope that you're going to win over the masses by doing so. Can you talk about some of the challenges in messaging against that kind of enemy vice uh, Al-Qaeda Central? Yeah, I mean, first of all, of course, the, um, the majority of what we did, of course, was in Arabic. Uh, not in English. So, I mean, I need to correct that perception because sometimes people, uh, for some reason, are obsessed with one video that CSCC produced in English, and whereas actually we produce hundreds of videos, most of them in Arabic, and so people kind of get spun up about one thing. But look, um, it is about that narrow casting. And so you try what you're trying to do uh, in the tempo of the work is you're trying to find something, anything that you can, that you can hang your hat on. You look for any hook, any advantage, any space that you can find, and you, you, you try to seize it. So, you know, the, I think people don't quite understand that, that when you're dealing in this kind of freewheeling world of, of, of what they're putting out, you see, is there something that I can take a hold of. For example, we never messaged very much. We did a little bit, but not very much against, uh, about ISIS uh, depredations against Shia, Christians, Yazidis. Why? Not because those are not horrible, horrible things that need to be condemned. They do need to be condemned. But because our target audience was a certain target audience a certain Sunni, Arab, Muslim target audience, which is ISIS's target audience. So for us, we would look for, <clears throat> for example, when you talk about the barbarism or the brutality, yes, that's a, that's a, a, you know, a feature, not a bug of what, what, of what ISIS does. But even, even given the way that they work, there is, there is, that is a weakness of theirs. And you do see some returnees and recanters, they say, I thought, I went to Syria, I joined the Islamic State, I thought I was going to be killing uh, Rafid the Najis, the filthy Shia, and what happened? I wound up killing other Sunni Arab Muslims. So that message, even with ISIS supporters, does resonate. So seizing upon their brutality against the people that they're supposed to be defending is a kind of common sense way to at least, you know, land a counterpunch at them. Mm -hmm. Again, not a panacea, but a kind of you, you take the opportunities that are given to you by the propaganda, whatever they are. All right, let's take some more questions. Yes. We have some Twitter questions for you. Yes, please. So first, can you speak a little bit about inter-country efforts um, to more effectively confront ISIS propaganda, for example, U.S.-Russia cooperation, and whether that would be more effective? And also, how can local forces um, be credibly empowered without tainting them through U.S. government funding or support. What was that? What, what was the first one, Ian? What was the second one I didn't get? Did you talk about UAE? Okay. I can talk about that. But. All right. 
Let me get a few more from the room. Yes, gentlemen in the front, wait for the mic, please. The, the word re reality came up uh, late in the uh, discussion and uh, about messaging. And uh, reality has a lot to do with intelligence on the ground. So how good is our intelligence on the ground? All right. Um, back here in the white shirt. Yes. Um, hello. Um, my question, uh, well, there is, there's been a lot of discussion about how we need to include the Muslim nations uh, in dialogue and everything. But my question is, when we have politicians in the West, like for example, the Hungarian Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, who said Muslims shouldn't be allowed to be refugees in his country because they're a threat to Christians. And we also have politicians back here in the United States, like Mike Huckabee, Bobby Jindal, who speak against the Muslim communi community and against Islamic nations and against religion, Islam. Don't you think this alienates the Muslim population? Okay. All right, so we've got a question about international cooperation uh, in working on messaging between governments. I, I take the question to mean. Uh, we also have a question about our intelligence on the ground, how much we actually know about our adversary. And then also the final question about who controls the message, basically. If, if you've got the US government giving its own official response, but you have members of different parts of the government giving their own thoughts, or prominent politicians, um, how do we keep control of the message then? And uh, Alberto, I'll start with you, and you can take any of those that you want. <laughs> you can take all of them. Uh, <laughs> well, um, I'm kind of fuzzy, I'm trying to think. Well, I mean, on the intelligence one, you know, I think this actually goes into the local forces too. There, there are, <clears throat> As I said, they're not enough partners. They're not enough local players. There are more than there were a year ago, uh, and that's a good thing. Um, you know, it's important to highlight, for example, the heroic efforts that are being done by local citizen journalists and citizen activists, like uh, the Raqqa being slaughtered silently collective in Raqqa, or Mosul I for example, and there are others in, in Arabic as well. These are heroic people reporting from the ground, reporting, giving factual, you know, uh, uh, truth about things, which, which is incredibly valuable. Um, you know, it's powerful. Mm -hmm. So that's good, and there needs to be more of that. Um, I guess that's an answer to that intelligence one. So Okay, and, and Richard, this, this question about who controls the message. I mean, you've worked in public diplomacy a long time. Um, how does the United States put its best foot forward or represent itself with one voice, given that we are a very uh, rowdy democracy with a lot of voices seeking to represent the United States to the world? Let me answer that in a couple ways. When I, my last posting overseas was in London, I worked with a Republican career, uh, appointee and a Democratic appointee. And the Republican appointee's main job was to defend, to defend the Bush policy in Iraq. That's what the Brits cared about. And they hated it. They really hated the Bush policy in Iraq. Bob Tuttle, car dealer from California, did a pretty damn good job. And it wasn't because he was loud. It wasn't because he was you know, obstreperous. He wasn't because he was neocon. It was because he was a guy who listened and responded as openly as he could and defended the policies that he was, that he was sent there to defend. Simple. Let me give you another example uh, that I think is more timely. Tomorrow you're going to hear a lot of crap about Benghazi. And it's going to feed into this narrative that you mentioned is anti- Islamic narrative in some ways. And you hear a lot of stuff about this. And what I want you to have in the back of your mind tomorrow when you hear that is that Chris Stevens' family, in tribute to him, is setting up an exchange program with young people from the Middle East to engage those people over the long term. I want you to think about that 
not the nonsense you'll hear from your politicians tomorrow morning. Thank you. Okay, let's take some more questions. Yes, please. Thank you very much, Alexander Kravitz. Ambassador LeBaron, you spoke about the freedom that you had, that, you know, from the president to, you know, to the cabinet level to act. And you mentioned that Ambassador Fernandez had less of that. And I wonder if your successor might even have less of that. And if that's the case, how is that going to impact the effectiveness of the center's work? I, I don't want to speak for Alberto on that, but uh, you know, I was in there at a special time and special set of circumstances, and that freedom was hard fought. It took us a year <laughs> to get to that point, and a year to use it. And and Alberto, when I was briefing him, he, I, the main thing I said to him is, "You're losing Hillary Clinton, <laughs> and I don't think you're going to get John Kerry because it's not his project." You know, but Alberto can speak about the political forces that he faced. Yeah, no, I think uh, I'm not a Democrat, but uh, I think Secretary Clinton uh, was a huge supporter of the initiative. She protected it. She uh, encouraged it. And I do think things changed once she left. I'll leave it as that and be as diplomatic as possible. <laughs> he hasn't been out as long as I have. <laughs> More questions? Yes, please, in the back. It's an assistant. Gentlemen. In the brown coat, yep. No, please use the mic because we're got recording one as well. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to take you back to um, something that was touched on very briefly, and that is how you measure success. Our success and ISIS's success as you look at, uh, at the messaging. What are the techniques for doing it? Because as long as we're messaging, we need, it seems to me, we need constantly to measure what we're saying um, in terms of the results it achieves? I can answer. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, there's always a challenge um, when you're dealing with sentiment. You know, how do you measure what goes on between a person's ears, right? Um, this in my public diplomacy career, I, I remember telling someone, you know, if I succeed in taking a person who is 100% anti-American, and making them 60% anti-American. How in the world are you going to measure that, right? And when you talk about counter-terrorism communications, how do you measure what doesn't happen? You know, I was gonna become a terrorist. I saw your video, I loved it. I decided not to become a terrorist. You're not gonna get that, right? So what you, you, you need are, what you rely on are secondary and ter tertiary measures of effectiveness. Um, you measure performance, right? X video was seen how many times? Uh, how many times was it reposted? What was the reaction to it? What was the adversary's reaction? We had videos we did in CSCC that caused ISIS, or was it Al-Qaeda? I forget, one or the other, I forget which one. We caused them to produce their own video. I think it was Nusra Front. We did a video on Nusra Front, and Nusra Front did a video back to what we were doing. That's a measure of effectiveness. The fact that they would try to block certain videos or try to take some things down or try to block uh, 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 Twitter handles, that's something. Uh, Will McCants wrote a piece in Foreign Policy which was about uh, in 2013, not 2014, when people were not talking about the Islamic State. In 20, summer of 2013, the Islamic State set something up on Twitter called the al Batar Media Battalion the Sharp Sword Media Battalion, to go after its enemies on Twitter. And the first enemy it went after was CSCC on Twitter. That's something. It's not, you know, it's Miller time, you know, we've won. Uh, it's something. It shows that you are provoking a response from the adversary. But I agree with you. The metric issue is, is, is you know, a big challenge. But I always ask myself, people were always asking me about metrics. And they never asked the guy who spent $500 million in Syria to train six guys about metrics. <laughs> <laughs> yes, gentlemen, the orange shirt, I think it is. How are you? Um, I want to know what the U.S. is uh, doing to, I guess, empower the Arab states to be a more active player in countering um, the Islamic State. 
uh, in the in the messaging realm. Okay. You, you have yeah. more experience. Well, there's a there's a promising uh, development. It is uh, it, it, to be frank, and I'll be brutally frank. Uh, it's extremely weak and uh, not very good, but. The U.S. government worked with the government of the United Arab Emirates to set up a counter-messaging office, which is called the SOAB Center, and it received some uh, PR when it was rolled out in, in, in July of, of 2015. So it's early days. It's very new. It's a weak effort, but it's the right effort. It's the right type of thing we need to see. The problem is it seems to be kind of like CSCC, small, not very active, not very prolific, but the idea of creating partners, of creating proxies, of creating networks is the right idea. And so that is something definitely that you, you basically, anybody who's part of our coalition or who's working with us against ISIS should have their own messaging capacity. They should have it for their own reasons, not because we want them to. One of the things I want to add here is that we get trapped in the notion that the only thing we should be doing is the messaging thing. And that we do a lot of countering violent extremism work around the world. I, I saw it in Europe last week. Um, that has nothing to do with messaging. That has to do with helping local NGOs empower themselves, comparing notes, bringing them together, talking about you know how you get at these issues, working with law enforcement. I mean, in Belgium, I saw policemen and social workers and political leaders sitting at a table with a dialogue that I have never witnessed in the U.S. government, a dialogue that they all were starting from the same base. They all knew where their boundaries were. They all knew when to call in the other person to intervene in a case of a person who was considering doing this. So don't, don't get trapped in the notion that it's all about social media and that the only effort the U.S. government is doing is this communications effort. Embassies around the world are focused on this. They're sending, they're organizing exchange programs, they're sending people here. So it's a, it's a big effort. The messaging is just a tiny part of it. I'm gonna close with a final question of my own. We have an election coming up, um, and a new administration will be put in place, Republican or Democrat. What one thing would you advise the incoming administration uh, to do if given the opportunity? Would it be to increase the budget, stop tweeting in English? One thing. Go first. Me go first. <laughs> it's one thing. One. Um, I, I would prioritize the creation of proxies in the region who can do some of the heavy lifting that we can't do. And I don't think it's, by the way, the fact that Uncle Sam is paying for people to do stuff in the Middle East, I don't think that discredits their message. Okay. Engage, 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 engage. In social media and exchanges and scholarships, act as if this is a long-term problem, treat it as a long-term problem, and act like a superpower. All right, please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.